Let's continue with our investigation of how differential forms uh, make electrodynamics a really wonderful, beautiful thing. Um, as usual, uh, what I did was I made up a problem set for my students, and I'm going to work through it. And the best way for you to do this, if you have the time and energy, is to pause the video a lot and try to work it yourself. Um, the f this top here is just a summary. If we define F to be this combinate this two form that combines the E and B fields together in a certain way, and the signs, there's a certain amount of convention to the signs, but this is one that works out. And if we define uh, a one form J to, by doing two things, we take rho, which is the charge density, and the vector J, which is the ordinary current density uh, from sort of classical presentation of a vector calculus presentation of electrodynamics. You make that into a four-dimensional vector. That's what I'm indicating here. This is rho in the time component, and then the three components of j in space. And then tilde it to make it a one form. Well, what does that am amount to? It amounts to just putting the j's in front of the dx, uh, one, two, three, and a minus rho in front of the dx naught. Because again, there's this funky minus sign in space time that we still probably want to investigate more. But it certainly makes this stuff work out nicely. Um, so if we define F to be the combination of the E's and B's, and J to be the combination of the rho and the usual J's, then Maxwell's equations become incredibly simple. F is a closed two-form, df equals zero, and when we do star d star on F, which is uh, basically the generalization of the divergence, then we get some constant times J. So this says the sort that says that that the fields are kind of I, it's sort of a generalization of like irrotational or conservative somewhat and that if you look at the source of the fields the thing that makes the field diverge in some sort of two formy kind of sense the reason you see divergence of E and B to put together in this way is that you've got some sort of source around the row and the J um, I put a K in here I wasn't worrying at all about the uh, the niceties of the units before, but I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, rewrite this with a 4 pi in here. If you choose the units appropriately, it turns out that this guy is 4 pi, and I'm really not going to worry about telling you about the, de the details of that. It's just that this is the way it appears in the book that I like best, which is Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler. Um, we also talked a little bit about how df equals 0 a lot of the time means that f can be expressed as dA, where A, and if you, you look at that equation and translate it back into classical uh, vector calculus electrodynamics, you discover that A is exactly the same kind of deal. Take a what used to be a separate scalar, the scalar potential, and the vector potential, which is an ordinary three-dimensional spatial vector. Put them together, make it into a one form, you get this minus, and it works out perfectly so that F is equal to dA. And so that this encapsulates the, oops, this encapsulates the, the connection between fields and potentials. Uh, and then this encapsulates the connection between fields and sources. Okay, so let's assume that we really can write f equals dA, and one of the things that uh, you may have seen, I hope, if you've ever seen the vector potential, is the fact that it's not, it's highly non-unique. You can uh, change A to a new potential A prime um, in what is a slightly complicated way in the old style, in the vector calculus style, to create a new potential. Well, here it's very easy. What could we add to A to make a prime. So a prime equals a plus, well, we just need to add something um, so that f equals dA and f equals dA prime. We need to add something whose d is 0. So a plus, let's just say c, where dc is equal to 0. So a closed one form. Well, a closed one form, let's actually go ahead and use the logic we did before most of the time and again there's going to be some interesting cases where this isn't true most of the time a closed one form is of the form C equals just D Ooh, I shouldn't have put that in the same uh, display here let's actually not even put it in the display at all Most of the time, a closed one form is given by C equals D. Uh, let's say lambda is a pretty standard choice for this. Uh, lambda. Okay. So, in other words, we're going to say A prime is A plus D lambda. That's most of the time going to be the most, the most general kind of gauge transformation. And it's just really, really elegant. It's just D of a function. Um, and so what that tells us is the freedom we have to change A to a new potential 
is basically just take any function on, on space-time and then take d of it and then add that to a. So I won't go much further with the gauge transformation stuff. It's really, really important to modern physics um, when this stuff gets combined with quantum mechanics and quantum field theory and stuff like that. Um, it's really at the heart of what are called gauge theories, but I don't, I'm not going to go in that direction at this point. Okay. All right, here's a fun, fun thing. Given if we know that f can be written as dA, if we're not in a situation where that's impossible, um, then we can actually combine everything into one equation. So why don't you try that? Pause the video if you want. We've got star d star f equals 4 pi j in the appropriate units. There we go. OK, but then I'm just going to replace f with dA. That's it. It's a really easy problem. Star d star dA is 4 pi j. That is essentially all of electrodynamics in one equation. j is a one form encoding the sources. a is a one form encoding the potentials. And if you do star d star d on a, you're supposed to get 4 pi j. Okay. And um, what is this doing? Let's see. Remember, this is the, the essentially the, the divergence. This is essentially the gradient, or it's a generalization of the gradient. Well, the divergence of the gradient is exactly the Laplacian. And so this is a version of the Laplacian operator that acts on one forms. And there's some subtleties to that. There's m different things you could call the Laplacian, to be honest. But this is an extremely natural thing to do. And so it says that if you look at the Laplacian of the potential, it's the source. Let me even write that down. The Laplacian of the potential is the source. That's a, that is that's not just electrodynamics in a nutshell. That's sort of um, that's a lot of that's a lot of, math, of, of physics and, and mathematics in in one sentence. It's really really general. Okay, I want to uh, get even a couple more physical consequences out of this this formalism. First of all, um, we might want to move this star over. Um, it turns out it's really useful to get the d here alone. And we've seen that a lot of the time star star just doesn't do very much. It's either plus or minus. And so if I want to move the star over, I, what I could do is I could star both sides of this. And I need to know what's going to happen with star star. Okay. So star star, for example, let's just do an example. dx naught, that star of, check my cheat sheet here, um, what was it, minus dx1 dx2, dx3. Oh, let's put the wedges in. And then I star that. If I just, if you look, if you watch the other other video, which you probably had to to understand anything I'm doing here, the one, two, three, just gets turned right back into. We get, we actually end up getting minus minus, and we get plus dx naught. Okay. Turns out it's the same for all of the the four. Um, that if you take star star on a one form, you get the same thing. So star star, whoops, star star j, for example, is just equal to j. If you look closely at two forms from the last video, um, it's not hard to figure out that star star is minus one on two forms, and in fact, even forms, even degree forms in four dimensions. Uh, and it's plus one on one and three forms. Okay. So that means we can, this is a really easy problem, we can just take star d star f equals four pi j. I'm going to star both sides. And the star is linear so I can move that in. And then I can just erase the star star because that's one. Told you it was an easy problem. Okay. So now here's something that's interesting. We've started getting interested in this. Uh, well, for a while we've been interested in this star d star operation. Let me go back up one more time. The star d star operation, which is this generalized divergence. What if we did that to J? After all, J is stuff moving. It's basically you know, the charges and the, the charge, the currents is stuff moving around. Taking the divergence of something that's like a fluid should is a very, very natural thing to do. Okay? So here, let's calculate star d star j. Star d star j, oh hey, that's gonna be star d of 
1 over 4 pi, which isn't going to do anything interesting. It just happens to be there because I like it. Uh, d star f. OK. So I'm going to move the 1 over pi out. And what do you notice? d of d. Does that ring a bell? d squared is 0. And we just get 0. That was the nice thing about being able to write this with a d in front of it like that. Okay, We didn't have to do that, but I wanted to make sure we had both versions of this. It's nice to, actually, let me say one more thing about star j. I forgot to say it here. One reason to talk about this is that star j is actually more natural in a lot of ways than j itself because star j is a three form. And that means you can integrate it over a three-dimensional surface. I'll put surface in quotes. Really a three-dimensional sub-manifold of four dimensions. Well, what do those things look like? Well, I don't have my um, easy way to do by hand um, drawing right here, but I'll just describe it. Um, one example is to just take a 3D blob, a 3D spatial blob, and with no time lapse, I'm just going to have it flash into and out of existence. Then the integral of the three form over that spatial blob turns out to be just the uh, just integrating the charge density over that blob, which gives you total charge. Maybe I'll come back to this and do it a little bit better, but I wanted to mention it since I've got this three form sitting here. Um, another example is take a 2D surface and let it uh, exist for some time. So we've got two dimensions in space and one invention in time. Well, what's the kind of thing you'd do with that? You'd like have a little, like a net or a mesh, and you'd watch stuff flow through it for some time. You'd get a total flow. Turns out that the integral of star j over that three-dimensional surface is just the total flow of, uh, just the total current. Not the current density, but the total current. Okay. So I might come back when I have the right technology for that and give you some pictures of how star j is really the more natural thing in a lot of ways. j is fine too. And it was nice here. We didn't have to use it um, for this equation, but it was kind of a nice way to see the d, squ d squared equals 0. So back to j as a 1 form. This is saying that some sort of divergence of j is equal to 0. Let's actually calculate it out. Star d star j, or star d star of all this stuff, OK, that's going to be star d of, OK, now j naught, now dx naught, uh, the star of that gets, the, they all get minus signs. So I'll put out a minus sign in the front. dx1, wedge dx2, wedge dx3. And I'm just going to copy that. And so dx j1, and that's going to be a naught, and 2, 3, yep. And then 2, and that's a naught, and for our convention it's 3, 1 to get the signs right. And j3 dx naught 1, 2. OK, and now we need to take d of that. And that's simpler than it looks, because remember, there's not that many derivatives we can take of this guy. It has to be the j, the derivative of j naught with respect to x naught and nothing else. OK, and then that's going to be a dx naught, dx1, dx2, dx3. Ah, that's exactly the correct order to be a plus sign. We don't have to switch it. This is all going to be times, let me see if I can put that in here, dx naught wedge. Okay. And then I'm just going to copy and paste that. And I claim we're going to get 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3. We have to be a little careful about the signs, though. Here we're getting the correct sign. Here, when we take gj1 dx1, it'll show up as dx1, then 0, then 2, then 3. So to switch it in, it actually is going to be minus. And here, I claim it's going to be minus as well. When I have a dx2, I switch it pi past the 0. That gives me a minus sign. And then 2, 3, 1 is in cyclic order. So that's OK. 
And then here again, the 3 passes the 0, and the 3, 1, 2 is in cyclic order. So, okay, now taking the star of a function times the volume form, that's easy. Remember the star of the volume form, because it has a dx0, it's minus 1, so that kills the minus. And so I just get, just everything dies except this. Okay. Now remember what j0 was. Our identification of that, I don't really need the parenthesis anymore. Our identification of that was that was equal to minus, and here a minus sign, this other minus sign kind of saves us, d rho, and then the j1, j2, j3 really were the components of the, the, um, the vector, um, the current density vector. And so this was supposed to be 0. Remember, just from d squared equals 0, this absolutely fundamental fact about differential forms, it's saying that this quantity is 0. This is almost a divergence, but we just have to be careful. Oh, this is not a minus anymore. Sorry. Oh, no, it is minus. Yeah, there we go. Um, we just have to be a little bit careful about that. Well, it really is minus the divergence, to be honest. Okay, so this just says that, let's move it over. It says that... Um, the rate of change, the time rate of change of the charge density with respect to time plus the divergence of the spatial part of j, just the ordinary j vector, is equal to zero. That, hopefully, is a familiar equation. Let me say it might be familiar. What it says is it's the conservation of charge. It says that if the j vector is diverging, that means current is flowing out of a region, then that's going to be balanced. It's, that's going to mean that d rho dt is negative. That means the chart, the total charge in that region, or charge density in that region, is decreasing. Similarly, if div j is negative, the arrows indicating the flow of current are converging. That's going to indicate this is positive, and um, that means the charge density is increasing. It's exactly the statement of conservation of charge. And so now we see it as a consequence of d squared equals 0. It's a really, really wonderful way to get it, get it as a consequence of d squared equals 0. And once you get a hang of this stuff, this calculation just becomes sort of second nature. And you know that star d star on j is a divergence. It's a sort of a four-dimensional divergence with the correct signs automatically put in to get a conservation equation. So this is super cool. The fact that, um, that let's go back up to our main equations one more time. The fact that j is star d star f mean, and the fact that df equals 0 combine to mean that the, the divergence of j is 0, and we get automatic conservation. So it's not something we have to put in automatic or artificially. We get conservation of charge automatically in a very, very beautiful way. And that's, oh, that was the answer to number 6, um, conservation of charge.